I am not a JRPG guy. I've tried to get into the genre countless times, even playing some of the all-time greats, even non-RPG fans like, like Persona or Final Fantasy. But time and again, I've bounced off. Now, I don't need to love every genre of video game. I've similarly bounced off fighting games, and I see no reason to keep trying my hand at them. But at least with fighting games, I can understand why someone else might like them. They offer a compelling challenge, and I can see someone that's more competitive than I am having a blast with these games. For JRPGs though, it's not just that I don't like these games, I don't really understand why anyone would. This seems strange. Such a massive genre with such passionate fans should have a very simple appeal, but for the life of me, I just can't see it. I feel out of the loop. Let me put it this way. To my mind, each genre has a core essence, a central appeal to its gameplay. Sandbox games offer self-expression, fighting games offer competition, etc. These appeals go on to inform every part of a game's design and mechanics. Individual games may have additional appeals, but these should always be in service of some core game essence. In terms of JRPGs, while I can see a lot of additional appeals, I cannot for the life of me figure out what the core appeal is supposed to be. So I've decided to go back to the beginning, to the tentpole franchise which all other JRPGs draw from, at least a little. Dragon Quest. Every other JRPG franchise has been, in some way, a deviation from or evolution on these games, similar to what Mario has been to platformers. So if I want to understand, really, what JRPGs are about at their core, the best place to look would be here. In addition, playing each game in the mainline franchise in release order should give me an understanding of how the genre has evolved over time, and how this core essence may have evolved, or possibly stagnated. We start with the original Dragon Quest. I want to experience these games to the best of my ability as their original audience experienced them. So while I may use modern translation mods, for the most part, I will play each game on their original platform with no XP hacks or anything of the sort. We'll see how long I hold that promise. Anyway, I've played my fair share of NES games, so I'd like to think I know my way around cryptic puzzles and dizzying difficulty spikes. We're going in raw with Enix's Dragon Quest. Being a diligent NES player, I read through the manual for the game before playing. Thankfully, I was able to find a translated version of the original Japanese manual. For the most part, I didn't find anything worth noting. A few paragraphs of story, some item descriptions, nothing out of the ordinary. The one thing that was interesting was in the starting player's tips section. It recommended players to immediately go to the town next door to the starting castle to pick up some gear, and then to immediately just start grinding slimes in the fields immediately surrounding the town. Then once the player first levels up, to immediately go back to the king to save your progress. This is very strange to me. In similar sections in other game manuals, they might tell you how to get to the first dungeon, or how to get a better grasp of the primary gameplay loop. Dragon Quest bravely states that this is the primary gameplay loop. The manual talks about dungeons, called caves here, but doesn't make a big deal about them. Your modus operandi as a player, it seems, is to go out into the world, cautiously ticking steps further and further out from this starting town, slowly getting stronger by grinding enemies. And the rest of the game seems to support this. You play as a prophesied hero who will one day defeat the evil Dragon King, but no one in the game really seems especially pressed that you take care of it immediately. You have to kill the big bad eventually, but you can take your time with it. There are other side quests, like a kidnapped princess and a mystical harp, and these do eventually tie in to your main goal, but no one really seems to expect you to take care of either of these issues either. So you instead travel the world in a haphazard, meandering wander, not in a hurry to get anywhere in particular. 
There aren't any real barriers in your way to exploring the whole map, in fact, other than the higher level of the enemies further out. The game structure reminds me of Breath of the Wild in its freedom and singular purpose, to the point that I wouldn't be surprised if Zelda ripped its structure straight from this game. It may sound like I'm criticizing the game so far, but really I'm not. In fact, I find this game honestly to be really refreshing. Other JRPGs claim to have strategic battling, but even the most hardcore JRPGs, like Shin Megami Tensei, didn't seem to me to have battle mechanics any more complicated than extended rock-paper-scissors. Dragon Quest doesn't even have more than one party member. Rather than making the game overly simple though, this allows the game to really emphasize and clarify its leveling mechanics above all else. Other JRPGs claim to have an in-depth story, but I've always found them to be rather dull, relying on manga stock characters far too much, and often confusing convolution with depth. Dragon Quest has no such delusions. As said before, it points you in the direction of the big bad and then expects you to wander around, getting stronger and collecting the necessary items to get to the final dungeon in your own time. Rather than making the game feel aimless though, this structure allows the game to breathe. Rather than using artificial barriers to block progress, all this game needs to do to prevent player progression is present tougher enemies as a natural mechanical barrier. Random encounters, which in other games I've played have come off as maddeningly annoying, here barely even seem like an inconvenience. Rarely was I in a hurry to get anywhere in particular. The map was compact enough that my destination was rarely that far away anyway, and often half my reason for traveling was to grind some more XP. I'm reminded here of what the don't push yourself too hard. This almost seems to me to be some kind of mission statement or moral that is central to the entire game. Similar to the phrase, don't you dare let yourself go hollow in the Dark Souls franchise. Other JRPGs claim to have complex puzzle dungeons, but well, I can't really defend this game's dungeons. They're the worst kind of boring maze through samey corridors in the dark. Well, at least there aren't that many of them. This is where we get to the more critical section of this critique. There are a bunch of minor critiques that likely arise from this being the first game in the series, but I may as well list them out here. The controls are sticky and imprecise even at the best of times. I really don't see why this game restricts movement to a grid on a console with the more fluid movement of Super Mario and Zelda. The lack of any gender options at the start is kinda lame. While the random encounters weren't too annoying, there really needs to be some kind of buffer between them so you don't get two or three or four encounters one tile after another. The holy water item barely seems to work at all, which was a major headache whenever I actually was trying to get somewhere directly. The inventory system is very rudimentary and became a bit of a chore in the late game. The game uses palette swap enemies a bit too often. Again, none of these are deal breakers, but in addition to these complaints, I have one major issue and a question. The major issue is a real deal breaker. The late game pacing is ass. I was having a swell time through the first three towns, really getting into the groove of things. Getting to the fourth town was a bit tricky, but I managed to skate through and then was able to grind some levels using the town's inn regularly to get to a decent level for the area. But then, after that, there's just a massive spike in enemy difficulty. If the enemy's level for each town had gone up one by one until that point, the fifth and final town must have gone up three or four levels. On top of this, the gold and experience drops didn't really match the added difficulty. In order to even get to the final town area, let alone get strong enough to face the final boss, I would have to grind hundreds, maybe even thousands of enemies. It was at this point that, I am not ashamed to say, I ended up save scumming with the sleep spell. This strategy even ended up being effective against the final boss, funnily enough. I'm no slouch to game difficulty, but this isn't difficulty, this is just an endurance test. I know this isn't really in the spirit of playing these games as their original audience experienced them, but cut me a break. I have 10 more of these to go, and I'm not getting any younger. 
I'd be willing to chalk this difficulty spike up to the games of Vintage, though. This would certainly not be an issue on the many remakes and re-releases this game has had over the years, so if you'd like to experience this game firsthand, I'd probably recommend one of those. But for the NES original, this would be a deal breaker for me. The question I have with this game is something I fear will end up hanging over this entire series, and possibly this entire genre. The question is, does this game's primary appeal benefit from combat? Centrally, this game's core appeal seems to be to start at some castle, maybe at some town, and then to slowly make your way out from that town based on your character's stats, preparing for dangerous random encounters. With each run, your character grows, and you can go further out into more dangerous territory. None of this, to me, seems to require any kind of battling system at all. I almost imagine some kind of Oregon Trail spin-off, where you play as Lewis and Clark, for example. You would play as a surveyor, filling out a map. Rather than HP, you have provisions, which would go down with each tile you move over. Rather than gaining levels through battling, you would get experience points by filling out more of your map. You could talk to townspeople that would give you hints to find special areas that give you an XP bonus. You'd run into random encounters, but rather than battles, they would give you some temporary status effect, either good or bad. You could possibly even make decisions around these random encounters in order to potentially avoid the status effect. As far as I can tell, such a game would have the exact same appeal and would even have a pretty similar gameplay structure. It would just do away with the kind of slow, mindless, and repetitive combat systems that JRPGs so often rely on. But I don't know, I'm probably speaking too confidently about all this. There's still 10 more of these games to go after all, and despite a rocky ending, I actually surprisingly enjoyed my time with Dragon Quest 1. Let's see if Dragon Quest 2 is able to hold steady next time.